Let's start some. Okay. Magic. We're in Samaria. Welcome to Samaria. <laughs> and this is where we were. We stopped here, okay. Then coming to you to a city in Samaria, which is called Sitar. Sikar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. That's not exactly what it says. This is some really interesting stuff. Okay, in Greek, he comes or goes accordingly into a town of, the, of Samaria. Of Samaria. Made, made a logical argument. Made a logical argument. Sisar, specifically. Legomenum, Sithar, Plesion, a neighbor of the place or property to which were what Edokin had given Jacob to Joseph, the mm -hmm. offspring of his, his offspring. Accordingly, accordingly, he comes to a town of Samaria by a logical argument called Sikar, a neighbor of the property which Jacob had given Joseph, his offspring. Okay. Now this sounds strange to us, right? <laughs> by a logical argument. Now, it just says, call Sikar. You know, I don't know why our translators, I know why our translators did this. But I'm going to show you what Sikar means. And when, you, when I tell you what Sikar means, you're going to go, oh, obviously it is a logical argument called Sikar. I think it's really interesting, though, our, our translators decided to fix it for us. And just said that it's called Sikar, because that's what we're used to, right? But wait until you see this. This is like <laughs> beauty, beautiful, just beautiful the way it works. Now, first of all, I want to talk about Samaria, because Samaria is a, we don't understand Samaria very well, but this is what, this is directly from my sources here. Samaria is a region between Judea in the south and Galilee in the north, so from the Galil and Judea where the Jewish people who had not been taken by the Babylonian or the Assyrian diasporas and captive displacements lived. So these are the people that weren't taken by the Assyrians. You guys remember the Assyrian, right? The Babylonian diasporas, right? The northern of it, North Israel was defeated by the Assyrians. They took the people. They took all the people. And that, uh, uh, let me explain this. Um, all right, the world has gone through, I think I always explain this, but it's okay. We'll hear it again. The world has gone through ideas of how to conquer peoples. And originally, the Assyrians showed the first way that you conquered peoples. Usually when you, and, and remember, the world, right now the world is populated greater than it's ever been, even though about, it's still a huge portion of the, of the functional world is not populated. There are places where the population is very high, but in general, there the world you could fit you could fit everybody in the world, every family in the world could fit on in, in Texas, and everyone would have five acres, I think, if you calculate it out. So the whole world is not very greatly populated at all. But back in the good old days, before we remember, right? In the ancient world, there were not huge amounts of people in cities, even the cities. We believe that Rome, Rome was kind of different, but cities usually were around 20,000 people, max. We know Jerusalem was about 20,000 people, except during the pilgrim festivals when it grew to about a million, which is pretty phenomenal when you think about it. So cities were relatively small, and populations were very small. So... In the beginning, when nations began to war, like the Assyrians, which were considered a very warlike group of people, what they did is they wanted to increase their population. So what do you do to increase your population? You go, you get the people, and you bring them back. And that's what they did. Imported. You imported them, yeah. They brought them in, and by the way, that caused the destruction of Assyria. What happened to Assyria? Oh, we hear about it all the time, right? Assyria is there in the news. It's there. No. Assyria was destroyed because they, the diversity of their population ended up eating them alive from the inside out, and they lost their culture, or they lost their society, and they were gone. 
And so from then on, people got this idea. The nations got this idea. Well, maybe taking nations and then taking people from the populations you defeat is not a good idea. We won't do this. This is not a good idea. We won't do this next time. So the Babylonians are the next view in culture of how do you take over nations, nation states. So what they did is they went into, for example, the example is to Judea, to, um, what were the two, Benjamin and, uh, it's Judea, but it's Benjamin and what's the other one, uh, the other two tribes, the other tribe, the Judah. Judah, 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 Judea, Judah, Judah and Benjamin. So they went in and that was the southern kingdom and they took it over, right? So what did they do? They, they took the leaders. They, uh, we're going to take the leaders. Number one, we get a freebie. We get slaves that are really smart and they're educated and they can read and write. And this is like, you know, so you, you get the cream of the crop. So they took the, all the elites. They took all the warriors. They took all the people that were of her, which is, by the way, what percentage of a population in those days? Maybe one. Yeah, really tiny. Really tiny. Like even today, what's the percentage of peerage in England? Peerage or less than one percent, right? You know, you could be one of those ladies and lords, right? But the peerage is tiny. My place. There's a few here. Um, anyway, so they that was the second idea of how to defeat or take over nations. So they they basically went in and took over, took the people out. Well, this turned out to be a very bad idea, too. But didn't, didn't they also affect the people that they brought in as far as the men so they couldn't have children anymore? They did. They castrated them. Yes. yes. They castrated them. And so uh, basically you have another problem. And the problem for, for Israel, right? Because when they went back, What's your genome? Your DNA, right? So anyway, this idea did not work very well either, but the Babylonians didn't have a chance to try it out very long because what happened to them was the Medes and the Persians took over Babylon. And uh, part of the reason may have been, may have been, what happens when you bring the elite into your social structures in your, your structures and let them control? Control. Well, they change it, yeah, and and it is possible, although we don't have records, but it is highly possible that the Babylonian Empire was undermined by the Jewish, the Jewish leadership that they had put in that place, because we know from Esther. You guys remember Esther? What was Esther? She was a princess of Persia and basically was an infiltrator, and they ended up killing Haman. And, you know, you, there's a lot of ways to read that story, and none of them are very good for the Babylonian Empire. Just saying, but the means of the person to defeat him. So the Romans got an even better idea. The Romans said, well, what, what should we do? We go in, and we put our people in charge, and we make them pay tribute. Ah, subjugate, subjugate them, make them pay tribute. Now, this works pretty well as long as you can maintain control. And as long as they have the legions and, and whatever. But then the barking dogs. Remember I talked about the Scythians, the Carthaginians. In this part of the world, they were a serious problem for the Romans. And then the other problem for the Romans was the Gauls and the Anglo-Saxons, right? And they got, they got beaten up in Britain. You know, the Scots, you know, those Scottish folks. Uh, don't irritate them too much. They're low population, but they're kind of dangerous. And you know, to build Adrian's wall. And <laughs> that's right. They built a wall to keep them out, and it didn't work. You know, Adrian's wall is not very high. And, and the Scots said, "Well, that's what we got." Remember what the Scots do? What What do the Scots do? They run along with the poles, and they do the pole thing, right? And they flip poles, and it's like, okay, well, obviously this is not keeping the Scots out of England. So that didn't work either. They needed a bigger wall. You got a big wall if you want walls, like the the uh, the Chinese did for the Mongols. And that worked pretty good. The Great Wall of China can be seen from orbit. So anyway, 
So the Romans uh, probably were the most effective method, and that method is even used today because that's what the Soviets did to a degree, and that's what the Nazis did, and Franco, and, you know, all of our favorite uh, groups that were, what do you call it, uh, colonizers or, you well, know. It's basically what the Muslims did all around the, the world is where they went, too. They conquered, and then they told people, like, you either become Muslim, you get, or you pay a special tax and don't proselytize or anything else, or you die. Or you die. <laughs> well, that's what they do today. It's right there yeah. in the Quran. Matter of fact, the mm -hmm. two main ways to salvation in the Quran is either you do all the stuff or you go to another nation and you you colonize. Yes, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's a type of jihad. Anyway, so Samaria is a region between Judea and South and the Gal uh, Galilee, G Galil, the Gal Galilee in the north, where the Jewish people who had not been taken by the Babylonian Assyrian diasporas and captive displacements lived. They were most likely by birth and genetics closer to the original Jewish stock. But because they were peasants and not the royalty or military, they weren't taken by the Assyrians or the Babylonians. And by the way, the Assyrians took everybody, so that's not a big deal. They were viewed very negatively by the current Jewish leaders. Their Jewish practice was closer to that of Israel after the kingdom split, following Solomon, and was considered non-Jewish by the current Jewish people. Okay, now we get this, right, because we know from the Torah, about the Tanakh and the Torah, how everything is supposed to be. But the big problem they got is, where did they worship? They had two places, right? Yeah. yeah. And the mountain of Samaria, right, which is basically Bethel, I think, in their thing. Well, I got a picture. I got a map. Um, but these were probably more Jewish than all the Jews. These people were more Jewish than all the Jews in there because what had happened to all the Jews that went over to Babylon? The males got castrated. The females, of course, in Jewish, uh, in Jewish uh, culture, the Judaism goes through Jewish, the Jewish goes through the female, so not through the male. So that's very convenient. It may have been caused by this because, and basically, they're really, it's unfair for them to be mad at Samaritans, Samaritans because the Samaritans are more Jewish than the Jews. Go well, figure. You mean in a racial sense, right? But so the worship in the worship sense or religious sense, as that paragraph said, they were still more following, like in Israel after Solomon, um, and was it Jeroboam set up the yep. you know the golden calves in those places, and that was a persistent problem that you know God kept punishing them over and over because they wouldn't get rid of those you know, false things that they worship. I don't disagree with you at all. However. Let me point out, was Jesus happy with the practice of the Jews in Jerusalem? No. <laughs> so he wasn't happy with their practice, and he wasn't happy with the Samaritans' practice. Uh, we got warring fights here, right? And Jesus wasn't happy with either of them. But for some reason, we're really down on Samaritans. I'm like, we'll see what Jesus thinks about the Samaritans, because I think that's what counts, right? And this is a really interesting account that we have about Jesus is married. So um, here is that place, Sikar, Shechem, and here is the area, and here is Samaria, and the Decapolis, right? Remember I told you the problem? It said Jesus had to go through it. You notice we got Dora, Caesarea, Apollonina, Jaffa. Oh, that's interesting. All Greek and Roman names? Hmm, interesting. Because Romans control this. For the Romans control it. The Greeks, basically, the diasporic Greeks control this because remember they were part of the of an empire, what the Seleucid Empire. Seleucid Empire. Here's the Scythians. Here's the uh, Perea. These are enemies of of everybody, of uh, the <laughs> legion, everybody. So Jesus had to go through here to get down to Jerusalem. He's uh, moving along, and here is about Sichar. Here is the word right here, Sikar, in Hebrew text. There are the letters Shen and Shen did not exist until scholars began to differentiate between them in the Middle Ages, dictionaries, lists, etc. This is just information about the word. The verb Sikar means to hire. 
But more than that, in societies where money was a prevailer, quite literally a luxury item, workers would commonly be paid for with food and drink and protection. So the word sakhar means wage, and the verb means it means wages. The ad adjective means to hire and may denote employed men or deployed items. The verb sakhar means to become drunk because, okay, money, currency is ubiquitous, right, in our society. But in this society, remember, currency was invented in 600 BC. Money was invented in, uh, no, yeah, yeah, 600 BC. So 600 BC, and the people that really pushed money, currency, was the Greeks. The Greeks were really into currency. They did, because they had silver. They did silver currency, the denarius, right? And so currency was a new idea. And so when you paid people, did you use currency? Nope, you didn't have it. What you paid them with was food, or in this case, they paid them with beer, not wine, beer, okay? And remember the beer? I told you about the beer. The beer, I wish I had some example of the beer from the, this period, because we know what Egyptian beer is like. It's really Coolio stuff. Barley, barley bread, I know some people love barley bread, all right? Maybe you love it. People thought barley bread was horrible. Even today, what do we mix with barley to make it palatable? Wheat flour, right? Ladies, you know, you made barley bread. Tammy has made barley bread before. You mix with wheat flour and other flavorings because barley bread by itself can be yucky. So this was known in the ancient world. So what did they do with barley? Barley was the first harvest. They turned barley into beer. And what they had was the beer was not like our beer. You know, our beer is like fresh and clear. Their beer was like completely full, like, un, you couldn't see, well, they didn't have glass anyway, but you couldn't see through it if it were glass, and there was barley beer, there was barley bread floating on the top of the beer, and everybody drank it from children. In the Victorian era, children were drinking beer every day, but barley beer was considered a wonderful substitute for barley bread, and so everybody ate barley beer. Now, there was a lot of it, and look at this. It was customary, for instance, in Egypt. In fact, early cities, water was often undrinkable. Yes, almost all water was undrinkable. And beer is the only beverage. Barley beer with barley bread in it. Sakar denotes a drink make, that makes drunk. Adjective, sikur. So therefore, sikar literally means a place where workers live and also where they get drunk. So remember it says, it was a logical argument that it was called sikar. And Sikar was known for workers. In other words, these Samaritans were not slaves, right? But they were workers. And that's a really interesting thing. Also, <laughs> they were workers, but also the word means to get drunk. So they were happy workers. <laughs> they were also <laughs> drunken workers. So, okay. Today we don't name things quite as logically. Because we'd probably call some cities in America by other names, if we did, not very positive names. But it's interesting that these names can follow, right, follow through history and actually tell us something about the people. Now, this doesn't mean all the people were drunks and all the people were necessarily just workers, right? But it's really funny, not funny. It is really interesting that that's what John tells us, right? John writes that it was a logical argument this place was called a place of workers or drunken people. So anyway, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Oh, there's all kinds of good stuff in here. Here's the Greek. I'll get to the transliteration. Jacob's well was there, Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. That's not exactly what it says, but it's really fun stuff. Was but in that place a font to supply water of Jacob. Be accordingly Jesus, feeling fatigue from out from among of the wearisome way to travel, was sitting down in this matter on or against the font. 
at a time or period that was which the sixth hour, sixth hour. Here's the translation, direct translation. But in that place was a font, supply of water of Jacob. Accordingly, Jesus, feeling fatigued from out of the wearisome way, was sitting down in this manner against the font. It was the sixth hour. In other words, he was, and it's really funny that our translators do not want to tell us that Jesus was sitting on the ground. I think that's really interesting. He was not sitting in a well. You did not sit on wells. That was a bad thing to do. They would probably beat you for doing that. He was sitting against the well, right, on the ground. Now, where the well is, Jacob's well, or this well in Samaria, the, Samaria, the well where the Jesus met the Samaritan woman, is an Orthodox cathedral. And you can go visit it. And this is what it looks like. This is the Orthodox Cathedral, and this is Jacob's well right here. This is the well. And the water is still drinkable. It's clear. It's not polluted. Yeah, I think they use it in the services or something because they, they draw it. But I don't know if you can taste it or get a, maybe they sell it <laughs> in the gift shop. I mean, that'd be really cool to get, right? Yeah. I mean, I've got some water from some uh, places in the Middle East. It's, you know, it's just kind of neat, right? Um, is it really from there? I don't know. Maybe they just fill it with tap water, but who knows? Um, but that is Jacob's well. And, it, oh, I want to talk about telling time. All right. Ah, come on. Ah. The Jewish method of measuring time. Okay, I got it below. Based on sun angles and specifically sunrise and sunset, very similar to the Greek and the Roman methods, but we're going to see the Greek and Roman methods. So the use of the term six hour means noon when the sun was at its peak. And here is, here is the Jewish, 12-hour uh, Jewish daytime. So here's, here's the way they kept time. So in John, John uses the Jewish time periods. So the six hours noon, and this shows the different hours of the day. Um, of course, I just have to mention this. 12-hour clock was invented about, oh, I think, 1,000 B.C. by the uh, Egyptians. It's relatively new. It's only 3,000 years old. Okay, so the idea of time, time is difficult, right? We've talked about time. And so the 12-hour clock was invented by the Egyptians because they, they saw that there was 10 hours of daylight with an hour on each side of twilight, which is exactly how we measure time for aviation. There are three different twilights, or three different uh, sunsets, by the way. Uh, I just can't remember them. There's uh, civil sunset, there's uh, ast astrological sunset, and there's nautical. There's, there's three different types of sunset, right? So depending on what your test plan is, make sure you got the right type of sunset, because it all varies. But there's an hour of twilight between the time when the official sunset, the sun goes down. And like I said, there's three ways of measuring it. And then the time where it is dark. So that's called twilight. The Egyptians identified that. And so they made their clock based on a 10-hour day with two hours on either side of twilight. Because can you measure time at night? Actually, you can. Use the moon. And guess who used the moon? Who, who based their, their uh, time on the moon? The Jews. They didn't have a lunar calendar. They had a lunar calendar, but not lunar timekeeping. Their timekeeping was based on solar, most likely because they came out of Egypt. But the Greeks developed a lunar calendar, a lunar timekeeping for hours. The problem was, what's the problem? The moon is not always out at night. The moon is out during the daytime, but not always out during the daytime, right? So if you're going to base it on something, you need something to base it on. So guess what? Everybody goes, well, this is a great idea, but it doesn't work all the time. So we need something that works most of the time. And in this, in this area, of course, it doesn't work in Britain. Right? Why? Cloudy. It's cloudy. Yeah, if you can't see the sun, you can't do time. Even your Red Rider BB gun is not going to tell you what time it is if you don't have the sun to see, right? So you got to have the sun or you can't tell. And by the way, 
Well, they use water clocks, but where was mechanical clocks really invented? In the in the where did mechanical clocks come from? Who invented mechanical clocks? Didn't the Greeks try? The Greeks may have tried, but these water clocks because you had to have power. But where it really got its going was basically, and I, I think this is correct, but the Swiss, I think, were some of the first to do mechanical clocks, like cuckoo clocks and other clocks that use weights or uh, springs, right? And why did they need clocks like that? Because, yeah, the sun was covered by the thing. Yes, sir. Well, part of it, too, is depending on what season of the year and the tilt of the earth, your sun... Noon is at the same time every year. It varies by maybe an hour and a half earlier or later at different times of the year. Bingo. Here it is. Greeks developed timekeeping first from the phase of the moon, but then used sun angles and eventually water clocks. The Romans, as usual, took from the Greek and refined them to make them more useful and more measurable. Here's how the Roman timekeeping using sun angles, a sundial, went. And if you ever look at a real sundial, this is the way they work. So they are actually marked for the seasons. So depending on where you live, if you have a real sundial. Now, the sundials you buy from Home Depot or whatever are probably not real sundials, right? But a sundial that is properly done, it probably costs you a thousand bucks for a sundial and have an expert Roman dude come in and do it in Latin, and you better translate into Latin. No, there's nobody like that anymore, right? So this is something that we have kind of lost, but everybody has one in their garden, right? Their own little sundown. Your Red Rider BB gun has one too, but you better correct it for the season. Spring equinox, summer solstice, autumn equinox, and the summer and the winter solstice. And you wondered why those were important. They're not just important for your festivals. They're important because you got to set your your uh, your, uh, um, your sundial, right? Mark your sundial. And if you wonder, ever wonder why sundials, sundials, by the way, can be, some are adjustable. They're, I don't agree, I don't suggest that because that's really dangerous. But many of them have pegs. They have little pegs. And you put the pegs where the season are, is. And of course, every house has its own calendar, right? In, in Roman and Greek. Times. No, no, no. <laughs> they have any calendars. You know, how do you know what time of the day it is? And by the way, the church calendar is one of the means or methods that people use to keep time. Nobody had calendars. Nobody had written anything, right? You, you, you could, they could, okay. It, it just, the world is a different place. These people were as smart as we are, but they did not have the cool devices and they didn't have like their smartphones with a calendar on it that will buzz, right? Just, yeah, Jesus had one. And, it would buzz on his wrist, whatever he needed. <laughs> anyway, so this is the sun angles, and I just wanted you to see that they're a little bit different, and, and this is the way they measured the hours, right, of the day. And it's interesting that everybody kind of took the, um, borrowed the Egyptian method, but look, this actually moves, 12 o'clock moves a little bit based on the season. That's because the sun, when it's 12, is supposed to be right at the peak, right? But it's different depending on the days of the season. Anyway, here's the Samaritan woman. Okay, in NIV, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? And that's not exactly what it said. That said. What's that? <laughs> With all that said, did the six hour mean anything? Oh, yeah, 12. 12 no. minutes. <laughs> in, in, in Greek. Uh, well, was there any importance to that? You, yeah, there's great importance to that, and we're going to get there. All right. I'll get to the most important part of why the sixth hour is important. Well, okay. Anybody read Centurion? Yeah? I took the first. That is not a great start, in, and I preach against it in my blogs. That is not a great initial scene for a novel. But I intentionally picked that initial scene based on the Samaritan woman, and I projected that, that – uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and also my protagonist mother, would be in the exact same condition as the Samaritan woman. 
going to the well at noon. That's a, a tricky precursor here, right? So here's what it says. Then come at the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me to drink. This is very important that it was at the sixth hour or 12 o'clock. Comes and goes a married woman, a married woman, not just a woman, a married woman, guy named, from her out from among the Samaria to bail up hydro water, makes a logical argument to her. Jesus, give to me to imbibe. When it says that he made a logical argument, it means that he just did not say, give me drink. He spoke to her, probably greeted her, spoke to her. There is more to the story than we get. There's more to the account than we get. A married woman from out among Samaria comes to bail up water, and Jesus makes a logical argument to her, give me to imbibe. How did Jesus know she was married? Okay, this is from Salzburg 2020. Uh, women in Talmudic period likely did cover their hair as attested in several anecdotes in rabbinic literature. For example, uh, Bava Kama relates an anecdote of a woman who brings a civil suit against a man who caused her to uncover her hair in public. The judge appears to side with the woman because the man violated a social norm. Another uh, vignette in the Talmud describes a woman whose seven sons all served as high priest, which is really interesting, right? When asked how she merited such sons, she explained that even the walls of her home never saw her hair. That's Yoma 47a. The latter story is a story of extreme piety, surpassing any law or communal cons consensus. The former case may also relay a historical fact of the practice. So we believe from Talmudic sources, we believe from, okay, look, nobody write this down, right? Yes, sir. Well, if she had been unmarried, wouldn't she have been required under the culture to be accompanied by a male escort? Or was that not always happening? There is another issue here, okay? And I've talked about this before. I'm not going to go into details, but that's, you know, marriage in the ancient world, which is a really complicated thing that we don't comprehend very well at all. But the fact that she is alone connotes she's probably married. It also connotes that, and by the way, married women were also protected, okay? They indicated their marital status by covering their hair. Unmarried girls generally wore their hair free, you know, open, until they were married, and then they covered it. And they do that, uh, I don't know if they do that in uh, Islamic culture, they cover their hair all the time, yeah. like after like six or something, right? Which is interesting. But in, in uh, this is, people don't write this down, and we have all this photographic evidence, right? <laughs> no, there's no photographic evidence. So we, the best we can do is we dig into our sources to find out how people lived in this period. And so the best we know is that women covered their hair when they were married. So Jesus immediately knew she was a married woman, plus she did not have a man with her, which probably connotes that she was married, and there's more to it. So the woman's hair was covered. We understand that unmarried women generally would not cover their hair. The question of actual marriage will come up later. Why is this woman at the well during the heat of the day? Social outcast. Yeah. She was a social outcast. And this is what I picture in Centurion, the first scene, because Mary and whatever the name, the, the, whatever the name of the, my character was, Naomi. Naomi. Oh, yeah, very good. I'm just looking up on my keyboard. <laughs> I was like, I, it's been so long since I, know I read it. I couldn't remember what the I've written 31 novels, and I've just finished one, and I'm, I'm editing it. So, you know, when that happens, you're totally oblivious to all the other stuff, you know. But anyway, um, yeah, and, and I named her Naomi on purpose because later on, Ruth is the name of uh, the centurion's wife, love interest. Anyway, um, so why is she there during the heat of the day? Because women went for water in the morning and the evening, but not at noon, unless they needed water. Or for this woman, because she didn't want to meet other women. The problem for this woman is her life and her background, which we're going to see revealed later. She went at noon because she didn't want to have to face the taunts of the other women. Um, you know, cultural, these are cultural realities, right? And you're not going to solve these by niceness, goodness, and, you know, the kindness thing. But Jesus did, which is really interesting. Because the, the, if you understand, the cultural issue here, okay? 
huge cultural issues. Jesus is a Jewish Judean guy, right? This woman is a Samaritan woman, married woman, you know, alone, going to the well at noon, right, without any men or other women. It's usually, why the women go in groups? Safety, protection, right? And, well, and they probably carried sticks too. But anyway, um, the disciples had gone into town to buy food. And this is really interesting too, although we don't get a whole lot in this. For the disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. The signing reason, the learners, the disciples of him, had gone off into the Poland, the town, in order that nourishment, uh, I go to sin, to go to the market. The signing reason, the disciples had gone off into the town in order that they might go to market for food. It's the King James, where did they get the idea that it was meat food that they bought? Uh, Trophus means nourishment. Um, uh, meat in King James period did not mean meat. It meant food generally, right? To me, that's like the term sweet meat means sweets that doesn't necessarily have to have meat in it. Mm. Would that be an example of how they used it? <laughs> sweet meats, okay, has multiple meanings, but you're not incorrect. I'm not, I'm not saying you're incorrect. Sweet meats is a really interesting word that means fat. Everybody, anybody had mince pie? Mince pie. Mince pie is full of sweet meats, which is fat. It has suet in it. And sweet meat was, in, in this period, was probably uh, mostly fat. And fats, um, okay, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll run down a rabbit hole. Just Sorry. Because, <laughs> no, because the, this is a Coolio rabbit hole. What did people use for sweets? Sweet. Sugar was not invented, right? So, you know the Germans. What did the Germans use to make sweet stuff? They had two things. Germans, all of Europe did. Beets. Huh? Beets. No, beets. Honey. Honey. Ooh, honey. But honey is really not. Honey is something really procurable in Africa and uh, southern thing and and. Uh, they did. But what did they do with honey? They made honey into meat. Yeah, don't waste that honey. You won't use that honey to make meat because that's the good stuff, right? Because it made really good beer and really good ale. So they didn't waste honey usually for sweets. You give it to kids. You give it to kids. They used two things. Almond flour was one. That became marzo. Another thing they did is they boiled citrus down get the sweet from the citrus, like lemons and limes and things like that. As a matter of fact, Liebkuchen, the sweetness in Liebkuchen comes from boiling down citrus. My daughter gives it to me, the leftover. The leftover is just almost pure sugar water with citrus flavor in it. It's really cool for making drinks. But anyway, um, yeah, it's wonderful stuff. And it's, it, they tossed it. They could have made old fashioned food, but they tossed it. Anyway, but the sweetness came from those things until the Great Revolution. You know what the Great Revolution was? Coal tar revolution? In the Great Coal Tar Revolution, what was invented? Saccharin. Saccharin provided sweet for people from coal tar. It was invented in coal tar in 18 something or other, and people used saccharin forever. Saccharin fed the poor until the invention of sugar. When they invented sugar, they sugar from beets and sugar cane, but really not from beets. Beets was later. The sugar came when they found the new world, and they said, well, this sugar cane stuff's really cool. Maybe we could ex export this, right, to Europe and, and not just make rum with it. We can make sugar with it. And that was the great sugar revolution. The sugar revolution that people, you know, they decry that. But it was, we see sweeteners move into, you know, things. And by the way, how many, well, fruitcakes, marzipan, Liebkuchen, how many of you guys eat that now? Do you, uh, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Not sweet, my arms can't. Yeah, and your kids will go, you thought this was good, right? <laughs> you know, unless it's like your tradition, you don't do that. But the way they made sweetness, right, a, a fruitcake sweetness comes from the citrus 
uh, uh, boiling the citrus down to that sweetness. So, and, and today people make fun of it, right? It's totally making fun of, but as our cultures mature and change, our tastes change because of the availability of sugar, for example. I don't know what's going to come next. What, what revolution next? Maybe we won't have anything. We'll just be starving to death in the cold, right? That's the green <laughs> revolution. Yeah. Um, anyway, they go to market for food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? The Jews do not associate with Samaritans. All right? Uh, there are also other issues in this, but we'll see what they are. Here's the Greek. And then I've got the, the Greek here. The woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Lega makes a logical argument. According to him, the married woman, the Samaritan, in what way or how much you, a Jew, belonging to Judea, on being from of me to imbibe, you ask, of a married woman, Samaritan of Samaria, also as being not, or oh, no or not, God or any reason, to use jointly Judeans, Samaritans with Samaritans. Okay, yeah, here's the English. According to the married woman, the Samaritan makes a logical argument to him. In what way you being a Judean ask to imbibe from me being a married woman of Samaria, a sign of reason Judeans do not use jointly with Samaritans. Okay, there's a whole bunch of cultural things going on here that are really, really, really deep. And John tells us that. For example, what? Okay. If you see a married woman on the street, what can you say to her? Nothing. Nothing. You have no right. You do not have the right under these cultures to speak to them. It's true in Islamic culture today. If you're walking down the street, you see a woman, a hajib or whatever, a habib, you just don't go, hey, how you doing? Right? Because she will not respond. It is not allowed for her to respond. Because if she does respond, that is considered culturally correct, incorrect, totally incorrect. Now, remember Jacob's well before. <laughs> Jacob talked to, was it Leah or whatever, talked to uh, one of the sisters, right? Uh, Rachel. Rachel said, Hi, hey, Rachel, why could he speak to her? She was an unmarried woman. And you could speak to an unmarried woman. Usually, what you would say to an unmarried woman in this cultural period was, uh, hey, uh, come on home, babe, you know, I'm marrying you, right? I mean, that's about the extent of. <laughs> Of their communication, but they could communicate with an unmarried woman. But to speak with a married woman was completely culturally forbidden. You just did not do that. As a matter of fact, we don't have any. We used to have a perception of this. Uh, there is a thing in in law in German law, and it still is in some American law called touching. So, for example, if any male touches a married woman, that is considered usually assault. In, for example, in German culture, you could actually be put to death for it. You could be put, uh, they didn't put people in prison, but you could be whipped for it. Because touching was a crime. And in some states, it's still a crime, which is very interesting. But, you know, you did not speak with a married woman. So according to the married woman, the Samaritan makes a logical argument to him. And by the way, makes a logical argument to him, which means what? Well, no, she just didn't say... Uh, she, didn't, she just didn't say this quote. In what way you being a Judean asked to abide for me being a married woman of Samaria and signing a reason Judeans not really use with the Samaritans. This is the telos of what she said. This is the conclusion of what she said. What she actually said was like, you know, huh? What? what? I, look, I'm a Samaritan woman. Like, I'm, I'm married, right? What, what are you thinking? Are you, are you like daft or something? I mean, like you're asking me to give you water? What What's wrong with you? You know, are, have you been in the heat? You've been in the heat too long. I know. Here, let me fan you a little bit, right? So it's a harangue. It's a, it's a it's a, a, a a long speech in which maybe Jesus responds, right? Ah, sure. Yeah, yeah, okay. You know, but they the conclusion or the telos is 
that this is what she said. In what way you being a Judean asked to abide for me being a married woman of Samaria? A son of reason Judeans do not jointly use with Samaritans. Okay, this is that thing, right? And by the way, is this in the Torah? Is it was before the diaspora? Okay, Torah Tanakh. The, the Tanakh and Tanora allow Jews and Samaritans not to interact. Who made that rule? Remember old Peter? Peter was going to Cornelius, and Peter said, Hey, God, I ain't supposed to be messing with unbelievers, with people that are not, uh, not Jews, right? Was he right? No. He was totally wrong. The Tanakh and the Tanori and the Torah do not say that. If he was an Edomite, maybe he'd be sitting on, on, on you know, it was to Herod. Hey, everybody, I'm sorry. You're an Edomite. That, that would go over really well, right? Uh, but remember, in the culture and the times, no. Matter of fact, there is no nothing that says Samaritans and Jews can't interact, right? And by the way, remember, they are DNA. Who's who's got the stronger DNA here? Yeah, I mean, most technically, right? So it's a, a Pharisaical thing where they take all of these laws to the extreme, and like because they want to be pure all the time and clean, and they don't want to associate with Gentiles at all, lest. Yeah, except the Samaritans aren't Gentiles. Right. Well, I mean, it's no, no, I agree with you. But they were looked down upon. Yeah. 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 The Jews were yeah. Exactly. Bastards. Which is kind of my message to you is I don't look down on the Samaritans. I mean, for example, this Samaritan woman is probably the smartest one in the whole gospel. <laughs> Just say it, okay? Yes, sir. Well, chances are that Samaritan, uh, Samaritans didn't think very highly of the Jews either because they didn't <laughs> treat them well, so. Well, okay. You remember what happened, right? They, you remember what happened. They came out of Babylon. They had a piece of paper that says, rebuild the, rebuild the walls, right? Rebuild the city. And the first thing that happened was all the Samaritans came to them and said, what they say? We're going to help. We'll help. We want to help you. And what did they say? No. Oh, no. no. You are Samaritans. You are dirty, nasty. Stinky little hicks. You can't read. You can't write. You can't figure. You aren't very nice looking. You got tans. We don't like you. We're, we're, we're done with you. <laughs> Go away. And what happened? It took them 70 years to build the temple. <coughs> Remember that? Yeah. You know, and they never got it. I mean, people are still preaching about Jeremiah and Nehemiah as if it was a, a good story. Jeremiah and Nehemiah are like the, one of the greatest tragedies of the Old Testament, of the Tanakh, because the people of Samaria came, we want to help. What could have happened? They could have been brought back into the fold. They could have brought back the, the genetic heritage of the Jewish people. They could have had a whole bunch of workers. They could have had the city built and the temple rebuilt in 70, less, less, 70 years less, right? Instead, they ruined their chances. Okay? The, the about proper worship in the temple too. Bingo! Everything, right? Instead, Jer Nehemiah and Jeremiah, in my opinion, are the worst, and the example of, of the worst of what humanity can really do wrong to mess up God's. Hey, Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah. Yeah, let's see. Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Ezra, well, Jeremiah is there too, right? Ezra and Nehemiah. Anyway, the the part that's most a lot of Aramaic. And, and poor old Daniel didn't have much hope either, but I felt bad for him, all, all those guys. Anyway, I'm just saying that sometimes look at the picture and look what the words say and see what the point is. Because sometimes God's point, I think, is really important and we don't absorb it. And we're like, you know, I mean, I've, I've heard for years. Yes, ma'am. Would, would Jesus have, was she saying to Jesus, he'll be unclean if I give you? I think, okay, first of all, they call them the workers, right? This is Caesar, the workers and the drunks. That's what they call them, okay? So, 
All the Judeans coming through there, all the people that come through there on the pilgrim festivals, you know, Samaritans, right? Type their hand, right? You know, because I'm what? I'm a Judean. I'm from the Galil. I'm, I'm from the better stuff. And you're just whatever you are, right? So these people are getting it. Okay, so finally you get one that goes, hey, could you give me a drink? Right? I'm tired. Can I have a drink? And she's like, well, is this candy camera? Is, is this a trick? Are, are you, are you, are, you know, somebody going to pop out and, like, beat me or something? Yes, yes sir. Sorry, she wasn't real friendly with him when he asked for that, too. It's just because the kind of stuff you're talking about sounds like she probably would have been kind of offended that he even asked her something. Well, you know, maybe... Uh, wary, wary, yeah. I, I'd say wary, uh, wary. Like I said, you know, if, if somebody, uh, I don't know how to how to draw the picture. You know, if it you wasn't culturally acceptable, and so she gets out of the norm, and she's kind of maybe taken aback by it. Yeah, yeah. If you're going down the street and somebody asks, uh, offers you a hot dog, you're like, oh, yeah, why? Oh, yeah, exactly. Why? And, and you know, more than that. Here's a married woman, right? A guy isn't supposed to be talking to her anyway. Yeah, are you trying to pick me up? What's going on here? What's up here? You know, it, are you misunderstanding my position or who I am? I mean, which is really interesting because we're going to find out about this. But beautiful, beautiful stuff. Here's this is an apocryphal allusion from Sirach. I won't uh, see, I just talked about the beginning. Uh, Simon the high priest, son of Onias, and his wife repaired the house again, that is uh, the temple. And in his days, fortified the temple and built the formation, built the foundation, double height, uh, high fortress, the wall about the temple. This is from Sirach. And then we go down in the bottom here and we find there be two manner of nations which my heart abhorreth, and the third is no nation. They sit upon the mountain of Samaria. And they did dwell among the Philistines, and that foolish people did dwell in secret. This is from the Apocrypha. And I told you before, the Apocrypha sets up. Let, let's see what it says. Now therefore bless you, the God of all, which only doeth wondrous things everywhere, which exalteth our days from the womb, and dealeth with us according to his mercy. He grants us joyfulness of heart, and that peace may be in our days in Israel forever, that he would confirm his mercy with us and deliver us at his time. There are two manners of nations which my heart abhorreth, and the third is no nation. They sit upon the mountain of Samaria, and they that dwell among the Philistines, and that foolish people that dwell in Sikkim. That's what we're talking about right now, Sikkim. Jesus, the son of Sirach of Jerusalem, hath written in his book the instruction of understanding and knowledge, who out of his heart poureth forth wisdom. Blessed is he, shall be exercised in these things. He that layeth them up in his heart shall become wise, for if he do them, he shall be strong in all things, for the light of the Lord leadeth him, who giveth wisdom to the godly. Blessed is the name of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Um, okay. Uh, Sirach is really important, because Sirach is one of the two or three documents that they got wrong at the Council of Jamnia. What did they get wrong at the Council of Jamnia? Remember the Council of Jamnia about 100 uh, A.D.? They were trying to decide which documents to leave in the Tanakh and the Torah. And they excluded documents which were they thought were originally written in Greek. Sirach, we believe, may have been written originally in Hebrew. We're not sure. We do have examples in Hebrew and Aramaic of Sirach. So Ben Sirach was probably written, and there's a couple others, Esther's one, but they, they left them out of the Torah and the Tanakh because they thought they were Greek. So, this is the view of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Jewish people about Samaria and Sikkim. This is where it comes from. This is, yes, you can get it from Ezra and Nehemiah, but you can get it even more from the apocryphal documents. So, what, what is the view of the Samaritans? They are. And stupid. 
because this book is a book of understanding and knowledge, who out of his heart poureth forth wisdom. In other words, Sirach is writing about wisdom. And so the view of the Samaritans is that they are not smart. They are not bright. They're not, you know, why, why would you put a synagogue in a Samaritan town? You can't learn to read. You can't learn to write. Well, good are you, right? I mean, this is this is a Judean view from the Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, and Zealots, and probably Teen Hodos until Jesus got a hold of their throats and said, guys, this is Samaria. And look what happens. I mean, we're going to see what happens. To me, this is beautiful. This is beautiful because look what Jesus does. And I only have time for a little bit more, but this is what Jesus said. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Okay, this is not the response you make to a stupid person. You get this? This is really important because this is King James. Okay, and we're out of time. I'll leave you with this. Jesus answered and said to her, If you think us, if you knew us the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me drink, thou wouldst have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. This is not a question you ask for a of a stupid person. This is not a question you ask of a person who is not bright and intelligent and able to figure this stuff out. Here we are, a married woman that shouldn't be talked to in the first place in Samaria. At a well, who's going there because she's obviously a social outcast and taunted by the other women. And yet Jesus asks her a defining question in Greek. In Greek. He's not talking Samaritan to her. He's not talking Hebrew to her Aramaic. He is talking Greek to her and asks her a deep question. This is so beautiful. Jesus did not even ask this question of Nicodemus. And we'll talk about that next time. Thank you, Father, for your word. Pray you look after us this week. In your name we pray. Amen.